Hello, everybody. Welcome on in. Welcome on in. Welcome on in. It is our book club night, and tonight we are recapping Hulu and ABC News' new documentary, The Randall Scandal. I hope you have a cocky handy. I hope you have some popcorn ready. We're going to get into all of The Randall Scandal right now. Let's do it. Oh, hi. It's me, Zach Peter, pop culture junkie, reality TV insider, published author, and host of the No Filter with Zach Peter podcast. Here I'll bring you all the latest news on The Real Housewives, deep dives into celebrity legal scandals, and unfiltered combos with your favorite stars. I've got you covered. And yes, I always keep receipts. So be sure to hit that like button and subscribe for all the latest tea. Now, let's dive in. On in, welcome on in, guys. I hope you are ready, Freddie, because we have a lot to break down. Hulu just released a new documentary. It was not The Housewife and the Hustler. It was not The Housewife and the Shaw Shocker because there are no more Housewife scam- scandals left to break down. So now we're taking on Vanderpump. So today we're breaking down the Randall scandal, love, loathing, and Vanderpump. I hope you are ready. I hope you got a cocky handy. I hope you got uh, some popcorn ready. If you have watched and you are in the live chat, drop a comment and let me know your first name and where you're watching in from so I can give you a little shout out and then get ready because I'm going to be chatting with Lala Kent at the Bourbon Room in Hollywood on June 15th, which is my 30th birthday. We're having a very special live taping of the podcast to celebrate June 15th, the Bourbon Room, Hollywood. Get your tickets at nofilterlive.com. Okay, so we have it here. The Randall Scandal, dun, 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 love, loathing, and Vanderpump. So we open things up with Lala, and Lala's on Juicy Scoop, and we see her walking in very dramatic, and she's like, and Heather McDonald's like, and so we we see that they're sitting down for this big tell-all interview, right? And so then we continue by kicking things off with the LA Times and their staff now talking about it and talking about how the scandal is now coming together um, or talking about how the scandal is coming together on their end because they started to pick up on things before they started to investigate it. And obviously the LA Times articles like was like one of the big shockers and that seems to be rocking all the the Bravo scandals, right? We had uh, Tom Girardi, we had Jen Shaw, now we have Randall Emmett. So we start off by getting into Randall's background, right? He presents himself as this underdog who always wanted to have you know, a pulse on all things Hollywood. He wanted to be behind the camera, but like was very much, you know, trying to make waves and make money and like really build a name for himself in Hollywood. Goes to school of visual arts in New York City, but then decides that's not for him. So he's going to move on over to Los Angeles where he moves in with Jerry Bruckenheimer, who I believe is his uncle, which random, weird, strange whatever then he becomes mark Wahlberg's assistant and that's where things kind of start to pick up for him right he kicks his door he kicks his foot open and now he's starting to make connections people are starting to notice him he's learning about hollywood he's kind of you know moving his way around then comes entourage and so entourage was a show that was loosely based off of mark Wahlberg's life which randall claims uh one of the characters was inspired by him turtle i guess is the character's name and randall's like yeah that was me i i i'm turtle i look like a turtle and i was and that's what inspired the character turtle on entourage they portray him as like this very ambitious guy and then he meets george furlow who's also ambitious and also very smart and savvy and understands the world of hollywood and so together george furlow and randall emmett decide to start a production company and it's called emmett furlow Oasis. And the business was set up really to make money with low budget action films. So they took old action stars like Bruce Willis and John Travolta. They make them feel young again. They make them feel like a star again because they're starring in a movie. They're not making the money that they were making back in the day. But you know what? They got a little Botox and they need to keep they need to keep the Botox paid. Right. So we'll offer them a nice chunk of change for just a few days of work. I believe they said Robert De Niro was the highest paid. And I think he was paid, what, like 10 or 11 million, if memory serves me correctly, for his role in uh, the movie that he starred along with them. But they also had you know, Bruce Willis, John Travolta, lots of these former 
actors, action stars that at one point were like big, bad, and bold. And now here we are and we're trying to stay relevant. So he also, we we see that he pitched a reality show about his life, which never got picked up, but it showed him as, as like this ball buster and this hustler. And he's like, you know, he's got his little Bluetooth in, he's got his phone handy. He's like, send it to Daryl. And he gives off like that sort of big boss BDE energy. But everyone's like, mm, you're trying to project BDE. But like, we really know it's real SDE. It's like SD and not even thick. It's not even a chub, right? So that reality show didn't really get picked up and go anywhere. He had drive, he had determination, he knew how to market himself. So this was just another way that he tried to market himself and position himself as a leader in this Hollywood film production space. His films collectively were grossing hundreds of million dollars. So it was a grind and they were building and they were, him and Furla were doing pretty well, right? They weren't all making big money, but they were collectively making some good dough in the millions for him. We have his former assistant uh, that gets into what it was like working for him. We kind of have these assistants intertweave from here on out. One of them claims that, you know, he seemed like he was in the big league. Randall seemed like he was in the big leagues. He said working for Randall, you know, he was riddled with anxiety, but that's every, you know, to me, I'm like, that's every assistant in Hollywood. Like everyone, like, I don't know, to me, the assistant pieces of it, we had a lot of like revelations and big stories from these assistants about how crazy it was working for Randall and how terrible it was working for Randall. I don't know if those stories are necessarily as compelling. Cause I'm just like all assistants in Hollywood are treated like shit. Not to say that that's good and not to say that their stories aren't warranted. I think I like how towards the end of the film, they're like, yes, everybody's treated like shit in Hollywood, but we can change that by talking about it and starting to be better bosses to people. So I, I get that i like that um we briefly get into amber child childers his ex-wife who he was very briefly um having a fling with lala kent with before he left amber for lala then we start to introduce lala's we didn't get into amber very much until closer to the end but for the most part like we didn't we like barely scratched the surface on amber so i don't know if it was that she didn't really want to be a part of the film or there's not much really known about their marriage but we don't have a whole lot of Amber at all. But we do get a lot of Lala, and we dive into Vanderpump Rules. We start off by diving into Lala Kent's upbringing from Utah. Her name is Lauren Burningham, and we see her mom. We see her brother. They're all participating heavily in the film. She apparently met Randall at a Christmas party, and that's when he had his assistant reach out and offer her a movie role, and from there, their relationship really took off. Then he landed the Irishman and the Irishman is what really boosted his career and seemingly boosted his his ego because before he was making a lot of these low budget films, not really paying these actors all that much, or he was paying them, you know, pretty pennies for a few days of work. And so he was able to kind of stretch and uh, make it work. And this is where we start. So Irishman comes out and makes it look Randall, makes him look very successful. But then Fofty Gate starts and Fofty comes forward and he's like, money by Monday, Randall, which hilarious. We loved it, right? It was great. It was juicy. So Fofty comes out and says that Randall owes him money. And this is the first time we really start to say, oh, what's going on with Randall? Why is he owing people money? Why is he not paying Fofty his money? Like Fofty needs his full dollar. He doesn't want 50 cents anymore. He's old and he needs the whole dollar all 1 million of them. And so we touched that, uh, we touched on that a little bit, which I think obviously Fafti loved the attention, but like, we think that that's what's continuing to expose these issues that he's having financially. We get a little more clarity on his show pump, because I remember that was going around for a minute that there was a show called pump that he was producing. People thought that it was probably related to Vanderpump rules because his girlfriend Lala Kent was on uh, pump rules. So this was supposed to star Arnold Schwarzenegger and we don't get a clear story or like a full idea of like what happens with this but Arnold I guess wasn't signed on to the film but he hired Randall decided to hire some writers to start working on it and then all of a sudden they pitch it to Arnold and Arnold seems interested in it but then it breaks in the news that Arnold is leaving CAA and he's he's leaving and hopping over to UTA which is where I guess the deal follows falls through unclear of how or why the deal fell through. Cause if you're in contact and you're talking to Arnold Schwarzenegger, 
uh, there are other people that should be able to help you be introduced to his new team at UTA. Unless CAA was like, yeah, this is a good idea. And UTA was like, nah, it's not really that good idea. We're going to pass on this, which also within the realm of possibility, right? But the deal fell through and that's where his team was basically asked out. And Randall didn't want to pay any of the writers the remaining amount, the remaining balance that they were owed in their contracts because he's like, the film's not moving forward. I'm not going to pay you what else you're owed. And they're like, well, that's a breach of our contract. So EFO, which is Emmett for low Oasis, refused to pay up. They end up getting issued a do not work order so that they warn other writers do not work for EFO because EFO doesn't pay their writers, which was smart. And so they ended up suing them. And I believe they were pursuing over 600 grand that was owed to them. And it's still owed to those writers. They have still not been paid. Meanwhile, uh, he's been, you have all these photos of Randall and he's like going on jets and he's posting about his extravagant lifestyle. And they're just like, um, you owe these people 600 grand and all your private jets and your fuel for your Rolls Royce, all of that stuff can be used to pay back these people that you owe money to. But they definitely made it seem like he loved the life of luxury. He loved to overspend. He loved to actually push his spending limits and, and and drain all of the money that he got, but not actually pay the people that are owed. And they're like, okay, how is it that you're going and, and posting on this luxury beach? And meanwhile, you're not paying the tap for the people that you owe money to. That's what we saw with Fofty, right? Fofty's like, you owe me $1 million and you got to pay it up. And he's like, no, I'm, I'm in the hospital. And he's sending photos of him in the hospital. And he's like, I can't, I'm busy and I'm, I'm distracted. I can't pay right now. I'll pay, I'll pay, I'll pay, I'll pay, I'll pay. And then 50, you know, blasts him on social media. And it's like money by Monday. And he's like, all right, here's the money. Shit, I had to take it out of, you know, Lala's nail expense for the month. JK, JK, I love Lala. But so then we see that he joins Vanderpump Rules and he's showing off his big life lex next to Lala. And at first, Lala was not interested in having him on the show. Uh, she was very much trying to keep him private. We now know that he was requesting to be kept private because it seemed like he was still dating Amber Childers. And that obviously did not end very well. So that's why he clearly didn't want to be on Vanderpump Rules at the start. I think it was all this attention on him from Vanderpump Rules and from him flashing his money and all of the other cast members posting pictures of him taking them all on his jet. I think that's what really put him in a bad position because that's what overexposed him. And then we get to Midnight in the Switchgrass, which starred Bruce Willis. And it also starred Megan Fox and Machine Gun Kelly. And I believe Machine Gun Kelly and Megan Fox have also kind of ditched Randall at this point as well. But so there were concerns about Bruce Willis. And... He was basically having to get fed his lines. He was getting tired and his memory was starting to fade. It's interesting because a lot of these revelations, aside from the additional commentary we get from people, is everything that was revealed in the LA Times article. Like, it feels like we got the LA Times article and we just recorded it in with a, with a series of interviews to tell the story. So good cash grab on ABC News. Good cash grab on Hulu because it made us all tune in. But I don't know if there's necessarily a ton of new information that we're actually learning. But we do get a little more details on Bruce Willis, right? So Randall kept pushing him. He would get pissed when Bruce couldn't get through his line. So the other staff members were like, you know, he's he's struggling. And Randall's like, well, we are only going to have him for this number of days because we have to pay him this daily rate. And like, I want to push through this so that we can get this film made and make a ton of money off of him. And he's not even coherent enough to realize what's going on. And one of the crew members details the struggles that he was having on set. And she says that Randall would be freaking out and yelling about how annoying this was that Bruce couldn't focus and Bruce couldn't read his lines. And for Bruce, it seemed like a lot of things just like weren't clicking and the longer he was on set and the more work that was put on him and the more strain that was put on him, it was hard. Like, yeah, you can put an earpiece and feed him his lines, but at some point, like you're going to get tired. And it seemed like he was getting fatigued on set and Randall wasn't happy about that. And so he kept wanting to push Bruce probably because like they revealed earlier in the documentary, he was paying them a daily rate or he was paying them a set amount of money, probably for however many days that they needed to work. And he was trying to cram as much as he could in those days work. That way he didn't have to pay them any more money. But poor Bruce was struggling and Randall seemed to have no empathy based off of the interviews that are presented in the documentary. Then eventually it comes out that he has aphasia and he's retiring from acting. Randall 
seems to have just seen Bruce and probably some of these other action film stars as a means to an end, right? Bruce was a cash grab and he didn't care about his mental well-being as long as he got his film made and he got to make some bank off of Bruce Willis while only paying him a couple mil. We see one of his former assistants that talks about, you know, needing to ship a poker table to Puerto Rico and it was so challenging. And the assistant talks about having to book his own airfare and book his own Airbnb, Airbnb up front because Randall didn't provide a car, a card for anything. That's a red flag. Like if your boss is not providing a card, you don't book the trip. You tell them, hey, I need a card to put this on. You don't put this on your own card. That's where I was like, mm, homie, you should never have actually booked any of this yourself. You should have. Here's the thing. If you don't book it, it doesn't get booked, right? And if he fires you, he's screwed. So he needs to put his card down. Let this be a lesson to any assistants. Don't let anybody fool you or trick you. They should always, your boss, whoever you're working for, if you're an assistant or a coordinator or whatever the case may be, always have them give you the card up front because that's just a way to guarantee the bill falls back on them because then it just seems challenging to try and go and get all the money back from you know whoever owes you the money. But the assistant also talks about Randall having Coke in his safe, which put the assistant in jeopardy. And like, I get it. Some of the assistant stories were really, they hit hard um, and I felt bad for them. But the hard part for me, and maybe it's that I'm improperly desensitized to a lot of this stuff. But in Hollywood, when you're a personal assistant, like these are just things that you do, you know? These are just things that you kind of are around. It's a shady business. You know, that's like saying, I worked for a used car salesman and it wasn't all kosher, you know, that doesn't excuse it, but also, you know, there just has to be a level of awareness. I do like how towards the end of the documentary though, they talk about how you can create a healthy work environment and assistants or people that are on production or crew, like you shouldn't stick around if it's not working for you, right? You either put your head down and take it and you know that there are benefits that come at the end of that or you leave. And I think the more people that choose to leave, the more they no longer enable this type of, of behavior because then what, you're just going to keep going through assistance and you're going to keep getting what shitty assistance because you're not willing to actually be a decent person or be a good boss. Part of being a good boss is enhancing your employees and enhancing your team rather than tearing them down. Tearing them down is that old school mentality of how we run things when you're a boss. Randall's not a boss. He's a pussy. <sighs> but that's kind of, I mean, some of these stories, I was like, listen, when you're an assistant, you do impo you run impossible errands. Sometimes you do drug runs. That doesn't make it okay, but that's just, you know, whatever. Uh, but paying for stuff, stuff up front that, no, you should always have a card that is owned by your boss that you put on file. That's never, never put that on yours because then people can really take advantage of you. And that's one of the biggest red flags. So that's a red flag to anybody that's like considering becoming a personal assistant to anybody. You have to um, never put things on your own card because these expenses can get crazy when people know that it's on somebody else's dime. So... We also don't know if these expenses ever got reimbursed. That's not clarified either. If at one point Randall did reimburse them or you go to their accountant, their bookkeeper, whoever is in charge of the finances and you make sure that person comes up. But um, the way they show text messages, the way that Randall refers to and speaks to some of his assistants, and I thought that they were horrible. You know, we see some really ugly text messages that show how much he berates them. And you kind of even see that in some of the footage for this reality show that he was pitching, the way he talks to people and the way that he, you know, just like degrades them or thinks that that's okay to treat people this way. And again, it's a very old school Hollywood mentality of I'm the boss, I'm the one with power, I'm the one in control. And now we have that paradigm shift, right? Where people are starting to be like, nah, I'm not going to be talked to like this. I'm not going to be treated like this. If you want good work, you have to treat me well. I'm not saying some people I think have really unrealistic high expectations, but other people like there is a little bit of like putting your head down and you know, doing some of the impossible things, not just for the sake of entitlement, but just like, I think it's also character built. And I think it teaches you a lot, right? When you have to be resourceful, like shipping the poker table to Port, uh, Puerto Rico or Puerto Vallarta, where did, I forgot where it went, but Puerto somewhere. Um, like that teaches you how to be a problem solver and how to figure things out when you're tasked with these impossible missions. So I do think that there is a bit of like, okay, I kind of have to grind this out and kind of see where I go and learn from these lessons. 
And then there's a, a line that, you know, you still need to be treated with respect. You can make the impossible happen. You can pull a rabbit out of the hat, but there's still a level of respect that needs to be, that, that is deserved to anybody that's working for you. Um, but yeah, and the way he spoke to his assistants based off the text messages that they revealed, I just, you don't speak to people like that. That's not how you create a healthy work environment. That's not how you build your team out. Like, it's just, it's not okay. Um, we hear from another assistant who says that, you know, she was, when she's working for Randall, you work 24 seven, um, which unfortunately is just a standard here in Hollywood or just in certain industries, you work around the clock. Um, again, don't hate the player, hate the game. I don't always love it. I'm not trying to defend it, but it's, you know, if not go work somewhere that has an hourly rate with set hour times. Uh, but the level of comfort that he had around his assistants, like when one of the female assistants talks about how he was completely naked in front of her, that's not okay. I understand her discomfort. And again, there are things that are not appropriate that are lines and boundaries that should not be crossed, period, end of story. And I think, you know, he definitely abused those boundaries and def or didn't set those boundaries and abused you know, the power that he had over these people because he thought, oh, well, I'm a big shot. I got money. I can do whatever I want and say whatever I want and treat you however I want. And you're just going to take it. That mentality needs to go. You can't treat people however you want. But she said that he talked to you with his hands down his pants and he would take calls using the bathroom so he wouldn't flush. So she would often have to flush for him. So there are a lot of unsavory stories about what it was like to work for Randall as his personal assistant. Then we get back to Lala. And this is where her mom says that Ocean's birth, their daughter, the birth of their daughter, is really where the relationship between the two of them started to break down. Probably because he'd liked when Lala was young and fertile and, and not pregnant. And, you know, now he's like, oh, she's a mother. Oh, she has a baby. Oh, we have to take care of a baby. But her mother says that Lala was depressed and that Randall just started to come around less and less her mom said that she started to see red flags and it seemed like she was the first one to see the red flags and um you know it doesn't sound like lala was ever aware of what was going on because it seemed like maybe she was battling postpartum depression so i understand where she's like what no flushing really yeah muddy grace it's gross i mean listen it's one thing if like you know what's that that line if it's mellow if it's yellow let it mellow about like water conservation, but I highly doubt he was doing it in water conservation. And like, it's just gross, like unsavory. But so Lala talks about being depressed or her mom talks about her being depressed and how, you know, she was starting to see the red flags about how little Randall was around and how little support Randall was actually giving Lala. And I think it's because he liked it when she was a young, fun, hot, sexy thing. And now she's sober and now she has a baby. And to him, that's not fun and that's not sexy. Then we get into Katie sharing the photos of Randall with the two young women in Nashville. And that's when Lala started, her antenna started to go up and she's like, oh, this is red flag, red flag, red flag. But he was denying that he did anything wrong. And then there was a moment where Lala ends up grabbing his phone to see what else he may be hiding. And that was when Lala claims that he tackled her and tried to get the phone back from her. He says that she attacked him, that he never tackled her, that he that she got upset and she was attacking him. So, I mean, who knows how true his claims are. I feel like at this point he's trying to save face. So... She said that she needed to get out Lala and she knew that she just had to wait for the right moment. And so she was pretending like, okay, things are okay. We can work through this. We'll just take some time. I don't want to be around you right now, but like, let's take a minute to actually take a beat and start to work on things. Right. And then the second that he took a work trip off to Miami, she said that's when she packed all of her things and left him to the left, to the left, everything you own in a box to the left, to the left, to the left everything you own in a box to the left and she snuck out and then when rando found out he nearly lost his shit he was like what she left and the assistant went and she saw that the closet was empty and all that was left was Randall's skeletons so it was not looking good you guys not looking good for rando because his house of cards was now starting to fall bofty was outing him um lala was leaving him his affair was getting his affairs were getting exposed so it was not looking good. And the documentary started to like get juicy and pick up at this point. 
But very quickly, I just want to take a moment to shout out one of my tried and true go-to health hacks, and that's Liver Lover by my pals at BioRay Inc. Liver Lover supports the liver to supports the liver to process toxins and it decreases frustration and anxiousness. I like to say it's like grace in a bottle. It's a revitalizing liver tonic. So you'll feel energized. You'll sleep more soundly. You'll have more vibrant skin as you nourish your liver. I've been taking liver lover for years. It's one of my go-tos, especially since, you know, I love me some coffee or a nice, I like a nice martini on a Friday night or a good margarita on a book club night. It supports and nourishes the liver, and it supports your adrenals, improves your body's ability to filter toxins, supports healthy metabolism, balanced mood, and healthy skin, and it decreases feelings of frustration and skin irritation. So liver lover ingredients are traditionally used to support the liver's ability to filter toxins, support healthy energy levels, and provide mild detoxification of environmental toxins, which I love. We want to make sure all those environmental toxins are filtered out of our body, even better. It's gluten-free, alcohol-free, non-GMO, soy-free, dairy-free, vegan, nut-free, all the things that we love, right? Now, these statements have not been evaluated by the FDA, but this product is not intended to treat, diagnose, cure, or prevent any disease. If you guys want to give your liver some love today, I highly recommend you head on over to bioray.com. That's B-I-O-R-A-Y, bioray.com come and give it a try. And if you're coming to our no filter night out with Lala Ken at the bourbon room on June 15th, then come try some bio recrafted cocktails. They're hosting our VIP pre pre party. So we have some, some cocktails and then we have a fun one called give them Lala with a little bit of, of, of lady passion in it by bio Ray. They're going to be good. It's going to be amazing. So check them out by Okay. Back to the rando scandal. So, now we get into Randall being sued by his former assistant, which seems like it was settled. The assistant had some really big claims against um, against Randall. Uh, and listen, we don't know the dirty, dirty details because um, the assistant ended up settling with Randall and we don't know what the details of it actually were, but... It seems like, you know, there were some big claims. Enough for Randall to not want it to get out for him to settle with this guy. So LA Times reporters revealed that uh, documents show that Randall's production company was actually struggling for a while, or at least before Fofty. They tried to make it seem like the pandemic is what really started to put them under. And the pandemic is, you know, what made them struggle financially but they're like no if you actually look at their records they were struggling for a minute and it they really seem to make it seem like the uh the reason the money was dwindling was because randall was a big spender he liked to spend a lot of money some of the assistants talk about you know the things that he liked to expend so lavishly on so Zach, was that the little bottle in your swag bag last year at the Spilling Tea Live? Yes, it was, end up. So the bio rate, they're, it, they're tinctures. So they're drops that you can put into your water, your coffee, your drinks, your cocktails. So yes, I they did come in last year's VIP gift bags for our show at the Bourbon Room for Spilling Tea. Yes, end up. Um, damn, I hate a settlement. I hate a settlement too, Colleen, because when there's a settlement, that means the documents are sealed and we don't have all the dirty details. And there's usually an NDA involved with it. But now they talk about how there's this ongoing custody battle between Lala and Randall. And it's really challenging because Lala claims that she just wants to protect her daughter, Ocean. Um, Randall wants custody. Seems like it's getting a little messy. And we don't like messy. <clears throat> then they briefly address Amber Childers and her restraining order against him, which was later dropped. I believe that was another settlement that was reached. There was a claim that the FBI was investigating him, but Randall claims that the lies against him have been stretched so far, claiming that, that the FBI was never investigating him as Amber claimed. And he said that this is all due to cancel culture and that cancel culture is really just what's, you know, what's coming after him and it's not fair. The first assistant that went back home with so much credit card debt should sue him for that money back. It's disgusting. I agree. 
But also, this is a lesson to anybody. And listen, I know because people come to LA and they're naive and that naivete is what can really get you. But like never put stuff on your own credit card. I actually believe that the credit card debt was paid back. I feel like that was something that I read a while back is that it it ended up um, getting paid and getting covered. Probably part of another disclosed settlement, but like, listen, let that be a lesson. Do not put anything on your personal credit card and expect to get expensed in return unless you know that like you can trust this person, right? And from what everybody's saying with their experiences about Randall, doesn't seem like he was a very trustworthy guy. So if you get bad vibes, don't trust him, don't expense, make sure that the money was run on the, um, make sure the money was run on the, on their card. So here's the thing. Randall is not a great person. You can tell that by the text messages. You can tell that by the personal stories. You can tell by the philandering. I'm sure that in his own head, he believes that he's a good guy being persecuted by cancel culture. But like at this point, like when do you take a little accountability? Like say, yeah, I was a shitty boss. And it's not just based off of these firsthand accounts of people saying that he was a shitty boss. It was about the... um the what do you call it the the documentary or not the documentary the reality show that he was trying to pitch where you see him and he's talking to people and he's like so demeaning and he's speaking to them in such a disrespectful way that i'm just like no you're not a good guy like there this isn't just cancel culture there's a level of cancel culture that's also accountability culture and i feel like he doesn't know when to see that that line oftentimes a lot of people that cry cancel culture don't like to see the um accountability or the role that they contributed into this as well that's not listen everybody's always going to come forth with a story and when one person comes out 10 other people are then down to join the fight and they have a story and the story is probably 10 times exaggerated but there usually is an element of truth right and so we we have to find what's the truth and what's the exaggeration but you can't just take no accountability and say i'm perfect and i didn't do anything wrong and these people are all just trying to cancel me for the sake of canceling me the only thing he sees is the one he's snorting yeah that's the only line he sees that's funny coffee buzz jackson should sue him for his money back yeah listen it's people are gonna sue lawsuits will happen settlements will happen i wouldn't be surprised if we see randall file for bankruptcy soon being like i can't do it i can't pay all these people but also here's the other thing, and this is the shady and unfortunate part, especially when it comes to Jax, is there's probably a reason Jax can't sue Randall because he probably had Jax sign a contingency agreement saying that his money, which is what, 70 grand, I believe, around there, was an investment and that it was a um it was an investment into a film that was supposed to be made. And the thing with investments is sometimes you, you make a bad investment and sometimes you lose your money. It's a gamble. So I think that's how Randall was able to get away with a lot of this stuff was by getting people to invest up front. And then if it didn't make money, then that was a loss. And you took you have to cut your losses and be like, I invested in the wrong thing. I trusted that this was going to be a mega bombshell hit. And it wasn't. So fortunately, that's just that's just what it is. And that's just where it stands. So we shall see. It was a good documentary. It was a bit long and I feel like it wasn't like we, other than like the personal assistants talking about how awful they were treated um, or the people that were saying that they were owed some money. I didn't think overall it was like a super juicy insidious documentary. Lala says and claims and alludes to there being much bigger, deeper stories to me, the compelling parts were like the fact that the FBI was allegedly investigating him. The fact that Amber Childer, Childers uh, took out a restraining order against him. Lala claiming that he tackled her to the ground. You know, people claim that there were a lot more women that he was fooling around with. Those, to me, are some of the more compelling jacks saying that, you know, he's owed money. Those are some of the more compelling parts of the art of the documentary that I feel like we just scratched the surface on and I would have loved to have gone deeper with, especially if it's a big Randall scandal, because otherwise it just sounds like he's a crook. He's, you know, a sleazy producer in Hollywood that was, you know, getting money and blowing the money and not really getting people's investments back. Jack said on Juicy Scoop that he gave him a hundred thousand and he pair and he paid him back 
25,000 saying the rest was coming. Yeah, it seemed like that's what he was doing. So unclear if Jack's made an investment or if it was a loan. But again, if somebody's investing, then there's a chance that the investment may be lost. If the investment is lost, then you're not necessarily entitled to pay them all back. So it depends on if it was a loan. That's not to say I like what Randall is doing, but there are standards and practices. And it seems like he found a way to abuse those standards and practices and use it to fund his lavish lifestyle. That's what it is, you know, tis what to tis. It's pretty standard in LA. It's pretty standard in Hollywood land. Um, not that I like it, but it is just what it is. And I think until more people speak out about these things and expose more of these people, it's going to continue to happen. So I do think that the documentary is a good thing by exposing it, but I just feel like there wasn't, it leaned a lot on, um, Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the super sticker. It leaned a lot on the, the assistant testimonials, which to me were compelling, but I'm just like, those stories are a dime a dozen, a Hollywood Tinder swindler. Yeah, he was a Hollywood Tinder swindler. But like, again, so are most of the producers here. So are mo most of the casting agencies, most of the agents in this town. Like, it's just... You know, and unfortunately, people are naive and they come from, you know, the South or the Midwest or somewhere that doesn't have as big of a city and that doesn't have the smoke and mirrors of Hollywood. And, you know, unfortunately, it's just, you know, the more we expose it, the better it'll hopefully get. But, you know, we're, I thought the documentary was good. I just thought that I, was expecting a lot more juicy stuff that Lala teased, but we didn't actually reveal it. And it's probably because a lot of those things are allegations and with Hulu and ABC news and the LA times behind it, they're, you know, a little more frugal with just throwing out tabloid flutter or loose allegations without thoroughly uh, vetting them. And so I think until we have, you know, some concrete evidence, it's a little tough to, to do that. I think people can get scammed no matter where they're from. Like, no, I agree. I don't, I'm not saying it's, it's immune to people that are from the Midwest or from the South. I'm just saying when you go to Hollywood, you often think like, oh, you know, it's all, you know, I'm going to be a star. Like you just, you, you're, the exposure is, is different. Um, and unfortunately there are just a lot more crooks and swindlers. Has Randall ever come out and denied all of this? He did a video, a, like an Instagram video, and he's like, it's cancel culture, and they're just trying to cancel me because it's popular to cancel people, and I'm not as bad as they say that I am. And it's like, maybe that's true. Maybe you're not as bad as they're claiming that you are, but like then own your shit and take accountability for what you did do and be like, yeah, I was abusive towards my assistants, and that was not okay. Anytime I make the live chat, you all are so great. Such a nice group of people. Thank you, Colleen. I'm so glad. I love the live chat. The live chat is always very sweet. Occasionally, we'll get like a, a Randall Emmett in the live chat and they'll be like, nah, 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 nah. but not tonight. Not today, neck. Or actually, not today, no neck. Not today, cankles. Not today, Randall. Mm, 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 mm. So that's what I've got for you. What else was happening in Vanderpump News today? Tom Sandoval is denying, because obviously there were rumors about this new girlfriend that he had that was like an influencer out in Austin, Texas. He's now come out and he's like, that girl is not my, I did not get head from Monica Pelosi. No, what was her name? Monica Lewinsky. Um, Tom Sandoval says that this, uh, what's her name, Carly? This Carly girl from Austin, Texas, who's like this model and influencer, that that's not his girlfriend. She's just a friend. But like then there were there were there was the quote in um, I think the Bravo Babe posted it about how um he allegedly was overheard at like an equinox saying that he was in town for his girlfriend, which may have been a lie, right? If somebody didn't recognize him, like I think as much as I don't want to give Scandal the benefit of the doubt, I think in this moment, like if you're trying to remain anonymity. 
And you don't want people like, cause then if you say, oh, I'm here to perform for a show. And then they're going to ask, oh, what's your show? What do you do? Oh, I'm a musician. I perform this. Oh, really? What's your music? I should check you out. So I get it for him to just be like, oh yeah, I'm here visiting a girlfriend or a girl I'm dating or whatever. So I can, I can see him possibly saying that as a way to deflect from actually talking about who he actually was. If the person at Equinox didn't actually recognize him. And, you know, cause that the rumor was that, or something was overheard that he was having this conversation with somebody at Equinox. Equinox and that they were talking about like, oh, what brings you to town? Oh, great. Da, 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 da. I've been in situations like that where I have like an Uber driver or I'm in town for a live show and somebody asks me like, what are you doing in town? And I'm just like, oh, I'm here for work. You know, I try to be like vague because I don't want to be like, oh, I'm here for a podcast. Oh, really? You host a podcast. What's your podcast about? Oh, it's a pop culture podcast. We talk about entertainment news. Oh, really? What's your podcast called? Oh, it's called No Filter with Zach Peter. Oh, really? I'm going to have to look it up sometimes. Where's your podcast available? My podcast is available on Apple Podcasts. And it's just like, oh, who do you interview? What's your, like, it's just sometimes you just, you don't want to have that conversation. You just like want to be anonymous and like not have to talk about what you do for work and kind of just want to be vague. So, you know, there are... I can see how that was possibly what the conversation was. Um, do I believe that he's probably hooked up with this chick? Yeah, she's a pretty girl. She's a gorgeous woman. Um, I'm pretty sure they've done so. Well, here's the other red flag. Is this woman, he's now denying that she is his girlfriend. But, I mean, listen, girlfriend can be used loosely. Raquel wasn't his girlfriend either, and he was having a seven-month affair with her. But... Um, Raquel was just a friend too. She was also just a friend to, uh, to Ariana. So you know what? Scandival, I don't know what I believe, but this Carly girl, she deleted and took down all her social media, which tells me, huh? Maybe there's like, why, what do you have to hide from? Huh, sister? Like, what are you doing? What? I have questions. You took down all your YouTube videos. You took down your Instagram. Why? If, why didn't you do what like Juan Dixon's alleged mistress did? Remember when she was like trolling people and posting photos with Juan and like they were making a joke about, you know, doing laundry together and stuff like that? Come on, Carly girl. Let's get it. What do we what do we have to hide? Why are we hiding from anybody everybody if you don't have something, if you're not guilty about something? Red flag. Um, what else? Uh, Raquel, Rocky, Rocky, bang, bang is denying her rep is coming out and denying that she's pregnant. They're saying she is not pregnant and that's not the news that's going to be revealed at the reunion, which in talking to other people, I think we've also come to the conclusion that maybe she's not pregnant, but maybe she was pregnant. Maybe she lost the baby. Maybe she had an abortion. Maybe there was something that brought, bonded her and Sandoval together. And that's possibly what helped the, the, um, the affair relationship develop even more. Like maybe it was a trauma bond situation because Alex Baskin was, who's a lead producer in Vanderpump Rules was saying that there are other revelations that we coming out at the reunion. I've also been a little skeptical and being like, well, maybe we're overthinking that. Like maybe there's not some big bombshell, but maybe it's like other little details that we just don't know yet that we haven't necessarily heard yet that we will get later on. Um, so they're claiming that she's not pregnant currently, but they, I don't know if they said that she's never been pregnant. Because, like, I hope it wasn't an STD. What, like herpes? Everybody has herpes. Welcome to Los Angeles. I believe it started much earlier. Yeah, Annika, that's a possibility as well. Um, but, yeah, they're denying that Tom Sandoval is in a new relationship, and they're also denying that Rocky Rocky Bang Bang is pregnant. But Ariana Maddox is on Call Her Daddy this Wednesday. So I'm taping this on Tuesday night. So if you're listening to this on the podcast on Wednesday, then the podcast should be out, and I'm going to do a recap of it live on YouTube with the Brav Bros, recapping the Call Her Daddy episode with Ariana Maddox, which should be juicy. It's Miss Juicy, baby. But so in the teaser that Alex Cooper released on Tuesday, it showed that Ariana was talking about it. And they're like, how you lost him? How you got him is how you lost him. And she's like, first of all, he lost me. Okay. So she made that very clear. She's like, I'm not doing Howie Mandel. I'll do Alex Cooper. But listen, Alex Cooper better have her shit together. Because if she doesn't, I'm going to judge her. And that's okay. Because we want her to be better than Howie Mandel. But Yeah. So that's dropping. And she, in the teaser, reveals that Tom ended up, he was in bed with Ariana and Raquel, Rocky, Rocky, Bang, Bang, was staying in the guest room. And he left their bedroom with Ariana to go and be with Raquel and to hook up with her while Ariana was asleep in bed. And he literally was hooking up with Raquel in the other room. Gross. Disgusting. Boom. Hate it. Don't like it. Garbage. Throw him in the garbage with the sprinkle cookies. 
And then he came back to bed with Ariana and slept next to her the entire night. Gross, disgusting, crazy, you know, which interesting, but I'm sure more revelations will come. We'll listen to Caller Daddy. I'll go live with the Bra Bros at our normal time, which is 1230 Pacific, 1230, 130, 230, 330 Eastern, 1230 Pacific, 330 Eastern. We'll be going live on the YouTube channel. I'll make sure it gets uploaded to the podcast for our Friday episode, our normal Friday live. So you can definitely stay tuned for that. I'll recap Caller Daddy. I'll recap the Vanderpump Rules reunion part one. That will be an episode that I'll tape on Wednesday, but it won't air until Friday because as I told you guys, I'm going to Chicago this week. I'm going to be at BlockCon with New Kids on the Block. Um, got a lot of surprises in store for this weekend. So if you are in Chicago, in Rosemont, Illinois, that's where I'm going to be with the New Kids on the Block at BlockCon. I don't know if there are any tickets left. You may be able to Google BlockCon and see if there are any tickets left if you're a fan of New Kids on the Block. But um I'll, I will be there this weekend and then I'll be in Chicago all next week. So content will be a little wonky next week, but I'm try, I'm going to try to at least keep up with our regular Monday, Friday, sorry, Monday, Wednesday, Friday release schedule. So I'm going to be taping my, taking my podcast equipment. So I'll be taping from Chicago. Thoughts on the internet roasting Ariana for hanging out with Marge. I, what do I care? Let them hang out. Let them be friends. Why? Because Marge cheated and... I mean, listen, it's in the past. They've moved on from it, you know? Ariana also technically cheated with Tom, too, you know? Zach, there's a TikTok going around saying, Scandaball smells, you have been around him. Is that true? Um, no, I don't, not from what I recall. Here's the thing. I'll drag him when dragging is deserved. I don't know if he smells. I've been around him a few times, and every time I've been around him... I haven't really like smelled him. I wasn't like, let me smell you. Um, but he didn't have like atrocious BO. But also like, listen, if he's getting drunk and performing at Tom Sandoval on the most extra shows, then like, yeah, I can see him maybe having a little BO and like maybe needing a little deodorant touch up. You know? I don't know. But in my experiences, no, he's not smelled in my presence. I'm pretty sure there have been moments where I've smelled and other people, we all have moments. Um, and of course, people are going to jump on that. I don't know. I haven't seen that TikTok, so I don't really know. But yeah. So Ariana. Oh, also, because there was this the the reports about Ariana moving out of the house. Those are not real. Those are technically low budget, even though we all jumped on it. TMZ page six, like everybody was like, oh, my God, Ariana's moving out of the house because she posted the Instagram story. And she was like, it's time to dip out. And then she's like, JK, JK, this is a sponsored ad for SoFi. And these boxes aren't actually moving boxes. They're finances boxes. She was wearing like a SoFi sweater in it. So it was a total brand deal. Some people are pissed about it. And like, I'm mixed. I'm pissed about it because I'm just like, really? Like you fooled us and you let the press run with the story that you're moving out. But also the press is so scandal hungry that they're going to run with every little thing. So that's kind of our fault for jumping on it without doing our due diligence. We just kind of like to, we were just like so hungry for scandal news that we just jumped at everything. We're like, yeah, give us all the scandal news. So I felt duped. Yes. But I was also like, listen, that's a big bag. You get the bad girl, get the money, capitalize off of it. Vanderpump rules ratings. They showed that the finale last week had 4.4 million viewers, which is insane for Vanderpump rules. Um, insane for just cable in general. Great, great, great reviews. I think Ariana got over 2 million for her Watch What Happens Live appearance with Andy Cohen. So good for her. She's making that money. So she got that SoFi deal and she's promoting, you know, financial literacy, financial security, financial dipping up. I don't really know what it was or what SoFi was trying to do. But listen, SoFi is investing in Bravo, right? Because we just had the white party, Kyle Richards white party that she hosted at SoFi Stadium. So I feel like SoFi is like, we got to get in on this Vanderpump stuff. Let's do the Beverly Hills finale. Let's do Ariana and Scandaval. But you know, that's a pretty paycheck. Kyle Richards paid for that paycheck when she did her party. And she had to rent out SoFi Stadium. So if I smart, so funny that you think of yourself as press. Um, yeah, I guess I should consider that. So first of all, don't fucking come into my comments and troll me, okay, bitch? Because this is my fucking live stream. Um, and I do consider myself press because I am a different category. I'm a subcategory of press because this is new media, right? Podcasting. You know, listen, you're coming here for news, aren't you? It's a genre of 
pressed. So yes, I do consider myself pressed. Do I consider myself the LA Times? No, but the LA Times and Page Six are both considered press and they're not necessarily in the same category, right? There's the Atlantic and then you have um, TMZ, you know, technically both considered press, different genres. So social media and new media have become a new genre of press. It's a lower tier. You may consider us low brow, sure, but it's still press. Look at the uh, the LA Times, the ABC Hulu documentary. Who did they feature when all the headlines were coming out? The LA Times right next to what? Podcasters. They showed Heather McDonald. They showed David Yonteef. They showed Up and Adam. So yes, we are a version of press. And guess what? You can eat my asshole because that's what you're doing here to get your news. Yes, I do consider myself press. You can call me lowbrow press, but I do consider myself press. Calm down, take Xanax. Says the troll without a fucking profile picture. Okay, guys, we don't need to give him any more attention because I see people in the live chat that are like, go away, go. No, 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 no. So, listen. I didn't say I was the LA Times. I didn't say I was the Atlantic. I didn't say I was a New York magazine. I didn't say I was even cosmopolitan, but shit. I love your brows. Thank you, DC. You need to, you need an eat my asshole merch. I know I say that pretty often, don't I? Um, But yeah, so it is what it is. Um, Okay. Well, this was fun. I'm glad we got to recap. Um, this Randall scandal and at least get a little update on the Vanderpump rules news. So I'll continue to keep you updated. I fly into Chicago on Thursday. So Wednesday will be like for the most part, fully booked with like me packing. Cause I still haven't even fully packed yet. Uh, which is a little annoying that I still have a lot to do. Cause I'm going to be gone for like over a week. I'll be in Chicago for over a week. Um, so I have to pack up myself and then I have to pa- pack up the baby Skywalker asleep right now going to be a busy day. So my point is, if content lags a little bit over the next couple of days, give me some grace. I'll be at BlockCon this weekend. I have a charity event next weekend, um, also in Chicago, and then I'll be back. And then it's countdown to the Bourbon Room. So if you haven't gotten your tickets yet, go and get your tickets to No Filter Night Out with Lala Kent on June 15th. It's also my 30th birthday, so it's going to be a big, fun event at the Bourbon Room in Hollywood. June 15th, Lala Kent and many other special guests will be there. We're going to have an opening by Jolene Lenzer, who's a very funny comedian. She was she opened up my show at the Bourbon Room last year. Lots of fun. Excited to have Jolene back. Um, thank you guys. Zach Packing Cubes are amazing. They making packing so easy. I'm sure they are. Can someone tell me what Randall was accused of? Being a jerk and just being a shitty dude and cheating, being a philander and just like spending more than his means. Basically the recap. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. You can always follow me at Just Plain Zach. Keep up with the podcast at No Filter with Zach. If you like low brow press, give us a follow. Subscribe on YouTube, youtube.com slash Just Plain Zach. Give BioRay a try at bioray.com. And until next time, guys, I love you. I appreciate it. Where did the cat go? I found her a lovely home. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. And I will talk to you soon. All right. Love you. Mean it. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye. Good night, guys. Chat soon.